But Yugoslavia became a target nation. The bombing was the culmination of a decade-long push by the Western powers led by the United States and Germany to forcibly dismantle the country. In 1999, the republics of Slovenia and Croatia elected separatist governments which unilaterally declared themselves sovereign states. The Yugoslavian federal court ruled that the question of secession could only be decided with the agreement of the republics. The breakaway republics rejected the court's, federal court's jurisdiction and the Germany and Germany, the US and Canada recognized these new states triggering a decade of civil war. During the bombing in 1999, US President Clinton said, if we're gonna have a strong economic relationship that includes our ability to sell around the world, Europe has got to be the key. That's what this Kosovo thing is all about. It's globalism versus tribalism. And in the New York Times, just four days into the bombing, columnist Thomas Friedman wrote, for globalization to work, America can't be afraid to act like the almighty superpower that it is. The hidden hand of the market will never work without a hidden fist. McDonald's cannot flourish without McDonnell Douglas, the designer of the F-15. And the hidden fist that keeps the world safe for Silicon Valley's technologies is called the United States Army, Navy, and Marine Corps. And as the bombing went on, NATO admitted its intention was to break Yugoslavia's spirit. And this prompted the famous Soviet writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn to say, he said, I don't see any difference in the behavior of NATO and of Hitler. NATO wants to erect its own order in the world and it needs Yugoslavia simply as an example. We'll punish Yugoslavia and the whole rest of the planet will tremble. After the bombing, of course, there was a widespread privatization and sell-off for a song of uh, Yugoslavia's resources, their industries, to foreign owners. Yugoslavia went from an upper, upper middle-income country, an advanced technological nation, to one near the bottom of world charts. The unemployment rate in Kosovo hit 50%, and the United States built its largest military base in Europe in Kosovo. And some three years after the bombing, Paddy Ashdown, the appointed governor of Bosnia, one of Yugoslavia's former republics, told a conference on foreign investors in London that they had, quote, managed to clear away the debris of the formerly socialist economy and open up the countries to international markets and investment. So the impunity with which Western powers destroyed Yugoslavia served as a model and a precedent Two years later, using the same motto of protecting human rights, the United States attacked and occupied Afghanistan under its Operation Enduring Freedom. And again, in clear violation and contempt for international law. And the US occupation continues to this day and of course is supported by Canada and Afghanistan where we have spent billions, and doll billions of dollars and seen the loss of 116 of our soldiers. And then in March 2003, offering a similar justification, the U.S. launched its all-out shock and awe assault invasion and occupation of Iraq. Iraq is another small country, roughly two-thirds the size of Manitoba. It had been under sanctions for 10 years, had an average wage of about a dollar a day by that time, and no way of defending itself. Yet the U.S., which has more weapons of mass destruction than all the rest of the world put together, accused Iraq having weapons of mass destruction, or wanting to have them. This was a total fabrication, much like the myth that Yugoslavia was being bombed to stop ethnic cleansing. The United States called their attack on Iraq Operation Iraqi Freedom and declared it was going to build democracy in Iraq. This was another blatant crime against humanity and international law, using a whole arsenal of illegal weapons, and this brutal occupation is still going on in Iraq. The United States has by now used over 3,000 tons of uranium, depleted uranium ammunition in Iraq and Afghanistan. What's essentially happening is that low-level nuclear war is being waged in those two countries against the civilians. In centuries past, wars were often fought, usually fought between armies that fought and killed one another. Now, it's powerful nations waging high-tech indescribably brutal war largely against civilians. And to date, over one million Iraqis have been killed and hundreds of thousands horribly wounded. Out of a total population of some 20 million, two million have fled the country and another two million are what's called internally displaced. 
the agony of that country has not begun to be known by the country, by, in, in the world at large. Iraq is one of the world's largest suppliers of oil. In the lead up to its attack, the United States had demanded that Iraq privatize its oil reserves, which the country refused to do. And under the occupation, the Iraqis have also seen their country privatized and handed out to foreign owners. Their president was captured by US forces, tried in a show trial, and executed, as were many of the other leaders. To its credit, Canada under Mr. Chrétien's leadership, and thanks to strong opposition in your province, Quebec, Canada refused to join the attack on Iraq. But Canada has been playing a key role on the world stage to defend and promote this idea of humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to, to protect. We're told that the powerful nations of the West have the right to invade and protect the citizens of so-called failed states, and it's the West that defines which is a failed state, from their own governments if their governments don't behave properly. This doctrine has now been adopted by the UN, and one of the first official examples of this doctrine in practice was, was Canada helping France and the United States overturn the democratically elected government of Jean Bertrand de Steed in Haiti in 2004, throwing that country into chaos which continues as we speak. And this same line is now being used to promote intervention in Darfur, Zimbabwe, even Venezuela, which we're told is not behaving properly. In all these examples, we're seeing powerful Western countries led by the United States and the old colonial powers of Britain and France, and increasingly now, as was mentioned, Germany, imposing or attempting to impose their will on small nations using the most horrific of modern weapons and the powerful propaganda of the mass media to legitimize their actions. And the Yugoslavian model was key in this development. As the American writer Diana, Diana Johnson wrote in her book, Fool's Crusade, Yugoslavia, NATO, and Western Delusions, she said, should the tough unilateralist approach of the second Bush presidency cause serious disaffection among allies, US leaders have the option of returning to the soft approach of humanitarian war that proved so successful in silencing the critics and rallying support in Yugoslavia. And her words have, are proving remarkably prescient. We have Diana Johnson's powerful book on the table at the back as well. Most recently, as was mentioned earlier, the Unilateral Declaration of Independence by Kosovo, which was recognized by the US, the Europeans, and Canada, is also it's, it's illegal, and its acceptance has implications for all federal states, including Canada. In fact, the parallels between Canada as a federal state and Yugoslavia as a federal state are very uh, uh, instructive, and Canada should be taking note uh, of what they are. In the past, Canada gained an enviable reputation around the world largely because it refused to invade or try to raise its flag over other countries on the planet. In the 10-year-long U.S. attack on Vietnam, the unspeakable war, Canada refused to send troops. Six million died or were wounded under the reign of U.S. bombs and biological and chemical weapons in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. I had a chance to visit Vietnam about 10 years ago. The hospitals there are still full of hundreds of thousands of victims of Agent Orange and other chemicals that the United States used. Canada refused to help the US attack and blockade Cuba in the 60s. And when the United States invaded the island of Grenada, Prime Minister Trudeau condemned the action in 1983. But over the past decades, and as our country and our economy has integrated more deeply into that of the United States under the so-called free trade agreement and NAFTA, two agreements which most Canadians opposed. Canada has more and more taken the role of helping the United States in its invasions around the world. Canada has the potential to stand on its own two feet and play an independent role in the world. And at key moments in the past, Canada has been a voice for the rights of all nations to live in freedom from the fear of attack by rich and powerful countries. This is a legacy to which we must return for our sake and for the sake of the world. 